I am here to tell you that actually the territory that's the most unexplored out of all the territories that we've been talking about is the universe, that is space. So we're looking at a picture. We found in the last 10 years thousands of planets that we have not yet explored. And what we're looking at here are hundreds of galaxies. So all of the planets we've found so far are in our own galaxy, and there are probably millions perhaps billions of planets that haven't been explored. So NASA is on a great journey right now, and we're exploring this nearby planet, which is called Mars. And so the journey here is to send human beings to the surface of Mars. And the thing about exploring unexplored territories is that in order to do this, in order to explore territories in the universe that are unexplored, you have to explore frontiers that are unexplored that are closer to us, frontiers in mechanics, frontiers in engineering, frontiers in biology, batteries, solar panels, Whatever you can imagine, 3D visualization, you have to explore these territories in order to do what we want here on these planets. So with our exploration of Mars, uh, what NASA is trying to do is put people on the surface of Mars, and this is not very easy. So we have three th main things that stand in our way. There's the physical, mechanical process of getting a bunch of mass from the surface of the Earth to Mars, then there's the problem of, okay, it's a biologic problem, how do we keep people alive in space? And then we have an environmental problem, which is once we get to Mars, how do we actually live there? So for the mechanical problem, we've been trying since the 1960s, essentially, to practice this feat. And so as you can see, all of these red X's up here, those are the failures that we've had trying to get to Mars. And so even though we're practicing a lot and we're getting better, there's about half the time we try and go to Mars that we actually fail. And so we're trying to, with humans, it makes it much more complicated. You have to take a huge amount of mass that keeps people alive in space, keeps people alive on the surface. You have to bring a rocket in order so that they can get back from Mars, hopefully, back to the Earth. And so, so how do you do all of this? Uh, so far, we've only really practiced going to Mars, and we've had these half of us, half of these things are failures. And we get to Mars, OK, we've never actually tried to come back. Uh, not even without humans. And so this is a challenge that we have that we're facing. So one of the big things that NASA has been doing to, in order to um, get at this challenge of how to bring this incredible amount of mass into space is what's called the Space Launch System, which is uh, the SLS. And so this is a rocket that's the largest, most powerful rocket that we've ever built in the history of mankind. And it's sort of a... Uh, a combination between the Apollo era uh, rocket, the Saturn V, and um, the space shuttle. And so here is an example of how big it is. Now you notice that right now it says, okay, it's not actually as big as the uh, Saturn V, um, but this is the first one that we're building. This is called um, the Block 1 SLS, and then the, it's, it's a progressive SLS. So you build a small one. This is actually a small one. We're going to build a larger one that's even larger than the Saturn V. I wanted to compare it to the Statue of Liberty um, because I'm in France, and voila, c'était un joli cadeau. <laughs> Merci pour le statue. <laughs> now I can use it to compare what size everything is. Um, so if you take this rocket and you split it up into its component parts, you can see what a difficulty this is to get such a huge mass into space and then onto Mars. So this part here, that whole bottom part's just to get us off the Earth and into space. And then the next part there, okay, that can get us to the moon, that little rocket up there. And then, okay, there's a rocket that lets us get back from the moon, that's very nice. And then that tiny little triangular piece near the top, that's what we're actually trying to move from place to place. And so if we could teleport that, if we could get quantum computer you know, going, so we teleport that instead of moving it all the way we we're doing today, that would be great. Um, and then at the very top, we have this piece, and that's sort of a safety feature so that if the rocket is taking off and then something bad happens, you can escape. Uh, and so, we're not going to send this all to Mars just without testing it, so we try and test every single piece as we go along. And so a couple days ago, they were testing that top piece that would save people, sort of take the crew away from the rocket if something was going wrong. And so they were testing it, the, the engines for it recently in the middle of Utah. Um, this test right here is for when the crew comes back, they're going to splash down in the ocean, just like um, Apollo, the Apollo missions. And so they have to test everything. Okay, what if one of the parachutes fails? What if we come in at an angle that we didn't expect? 
Uh, we have to come in really, if we're coming in from Mars, we're going to come in really, really fast. And so that, how does that affect? It's like the ultimate crash test. So the, first, the idea with the SLS is that the first thing that we're going to do, there was already a test of the Orion capsule, which is where the crew goes, and that splashed down in the, in the ocean. The first test of the SLS will be called um, EM1, and that's supposed to go to the moon, and it'll go around the moon, and it'll test all of our technologies for the rocket, and all of our technologies come back, splash down in the surface, but there will be no people in that one. And so that's in 2019. In 2021, we're going to put some people on that. So this EM1, what it's going to do is drop off a bunch of CubeSats in the region of the moon. So, okay, what if we can get all of this mass off the surface? Then we get to Mars, now we have to slow it down so we don't, what well, we, we call it lithobraking, so that's when <laughs> you break by hitting rock really hard. Okay, we don't want to do that. Um, we want to slow down our spacecraft and so that we can land gently. And so what we're working on here, it's called, like in the past we've landed with a combination of parachutes, then we have retropropulsion of our rockets, sometimes we have airbags we bounce on. And so this would be, okay, how can we do the whole thing with just retro propulsion, kind of like we landed on the moon. The Martian atmosphere is the worst possible atmosphere you can imagine because it is thick enough so that you can't just land on the moon like we did with Apollo, uh, you know, using retro propulsion. There's an atmosphere that gets in the way, but the atmosphere is not thick enough so that it slows us down to any reasonable amount. So we have to model, this is a new frontier that we have to kind of go into as far as uh, even fluid mechanics to say, okay, what if we're going supersonic at a really high Mach number through the atmosphere, and then we're igniting a rocket engine also. <laughs> That's a really complicated problem. So this is something that NASA is actually working on with SpaceX, because every time SpaceX comes back with their rockets to land through our atmosphere, they go through a part of the atmosphere that's very thin, kind of like the Martian atmosphere, and they shoot their rockets off to actually simulate in real time a real experiment of what it would be like to try and slow down in the Martian atmosphere. So those are really big mechanical problems. Um, but you know we can overcome mechanical problems, and we've been working on that for a while. Another huge issue is a biological problem. How do you keep people alive in space? And this is something we've been working on for decades with the International Space Station, with all of our international partners. And so human beings are pretty fragile. You know, we can bring machines at huge gravity numbers, Mach numbers, and they're fine. Humans are, aren't as, uh, they're less resilient, I would say. And so one of the things that NASA has been doing recently is they had a twin study where they took astronaut Scott Kelly. He actually had a twin brother who's also an astronaut, Mark Kelly, very convenient. <laughs> so they, they've put Scott Kelly in space for about a year, and they, they've kept his twin brother here on the Earth. And so what they could do in that case is they could say, okay, here are two people with similar DNA. We can say ahead of time how similar they are to each other. Then we can see what differences come about because of Scott Kelly's time in space. And there's a lot of things that happen. In, in your space, you're not in gravity, and so your muscles start to deteriorate, become like jelly. Your heart, which is also a muscle, it's no longer beating against the pull of gravity, and so your heart gets really weak. Um, even they were saying that your eyesight changes because your eyeballs are just floating in your head instead of being squashed by gravity. So these astronauts come back with vision problems. And so even Scott Kelly came back slightly taller than he was when he, when he left. He's taller than his brother just because his spine was getting longer. Uh, and then when he came back, he got shorter again. So <laughs> we don't want to send an astronaut to Mars, and then when they arrive on Mars, they can't actually do anything. They're just sitting there like, oh, my muscles are all jelly, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so here's an example of you know, the astronauts working out in space. They have to work out almost all the time. So one of the key things about this is that we're going to send, we want to send people into deep space. If you're in the space station, you're protected by the Earth's magnetic field, and you're protected because you can just say, oh, hey, NASA, can, I, can you guys send me something? We can send them in, you know, in a couple of days something to replace something or fix something. If you're going to Mars and it takes months, uh, up to you know, six months to go to Mars, you, could just, you can't have something that breaks in the middle of the voyage. So you can't have a thing that breaks all the time. So we're going to send uh, you know, a kind of a space station, and it's going to be in orbit around the moon. And the idea there is that we have to really work on more unexplored territories, which is really the almost complete recycling of all of the wastes uh, that humans produce. We have to work on um, 
We have to work on, okay, if something breaks, how can we fix it? So that's, that's a lot of this 3D printing. So people take, as they say, oh, I need a, you don't know what problem's going to happen. You can't take every tool with you. But you, if you can say, hey, NASA, I need a tool, and NASA can email you that tool and you can print it, then that's a lot easier. And so we want to practice all of this stuff close to the Earth so that it's maybe four days away from being saved rather than six months before we go to Mars. Uh, the third grand challenge is land then landing on Mars. Where are we going to go? Uh, because Mars is an entire planet, just like the Earth. And so you have places that are cloudy, you have places that are covered in feet of CO2. I'm in France, so I guess covered in meters of CO2. <laughs> and you have places near the equator that are very nice in temperature, maybe 20 degrees C on a nice day. Uh, other places at the pole, maybe uh, minus 165 C. And so you have to think very carefully about where you want to go. And Mars presents us this dilemma, which is that, OK, we don't want to bring all of that mass with us. What can we do with the resources that we have on the surface to maybe make some rocket fuel, and then we don't have to bring it all with us? So if you see this map here, I'm showing the water that's actually on Mars, and you can make rocket fuel out of water. So Mars is terrible in that it's got a lot of water, and that's great, but all the water is in terrible places. So <laughs> it's in all those places where it's really cold. That's, it's not a big surprise. And so if we want to live at the equator where the temperature's nice and so we can live, you know, have a good boost for our rockets into orbit, we also have to live in a place that's very dry. And so this is what we're trying to figure out, and this is something that I work on personally, is how can we live in a place where we can have some room to grow? That we not only get there and live, but you know, say we want to do some farming, say we want to do some mining, say we want to build a city. What's the best place that we can go to so that in the future people don't look back and say, why did those fools choose to go to this place <laughs> when obviously the best place was over there? Um, because Mars isn't just, as I say, like a grand challenge uh, that's that we're trying to do just because it's difficult. That is one of the reasons we want to do it. But fundamentally, all of the things that we've been talking about, like, OK, let's print DNA, and let's have a quantum computer, let's get good sleep at night, you know, they're vulnerable in some way. This is from my perspective of the universe. A single asteroid comes, and all the progress we've made in the history of mankind, we go back to a bacteria. <laughs> so, so a lot of people think that the only real way that you can be sure of humanity's survival and humanity's continuous, uh, continuity is to be a multi-planet species. So that's why it's not just NASA that's on this journey. It's really lots of different countries and uh, even private enterprises that are on this journey to try and get to Mars, and that's kind of what lies behind it. So I would say that the journey to Mars it's, you know, I don't think I'm exaggerating if I would say that putting people to live on Mars might be the most ambitious project that mankind has ever attempted. <laughs> and part of the reason for that is because it draws on, it, it's not just me, just one person that can get to Mars. You need thousands and thousands of people, and they all have to have different capacities, and they all have to come from different domains. And in order to explore this unexplored territory, we have to explore the territories of engineering, biomechanics, um, yeah, biomedical devices, and energy production, and all of the different domains that touch us in our daily lives we actually need in order to do this. Uh, chief among them, I would say, in evolution and exploration in our way of thinking. Mm -hmm.